Welcome back to a special episode of Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about five unexpected reactions that I had during my PhD. So my background involves sulfur and fluorine. That's what most of my chemistry has involved. Here's some pictures of some of the stuff I made, and this forbidden ice cream sandwich here is just a block of dry ice. Most of my work has involved thiocarbonyl chemistry, but today I'm going to be talking about chemical reactions that produced something unexpected. So the first one is this allyl ether, which is an unexpected E2 reaction. And so in one of my projects, I needed to make primary iodides because we made this nucleophile that kind of sucked and it would react with only primary iodides, not even primary bromides. So what I did was I got a bunch of primary bromides and I reacted them with sodium iodide to get a primary iodide, which is the Finkelstein reaction. Now, one of the ways I did this was I made derivatives of phenol using 1,3-dibromopropane. And whenever I analyzed these reactions, these would usually be like an overnight reaction, I always saw another spot by TLC that wasn't starting material and it wasn't product. And after doing some analysis of this pure side product, it turned out to be an allylated side product. And so what I was doing is I was doing an SN2 reaction of phenoxide on 1,3-dibromopropane, and what I was getting mostly is the desired 1-phenoxy-3-bromo product. However, I was also observing the elimination of the bromide to this uh, allyl product. And so I'm not totally sure whether or not this was forming allyl bromide from the 1,3-dibromopropane, or if the blue product was being eliminated to form the orange product, but I never observed this type of elimination in any other instance with a primary alkyl iodide or bromide using potassium carbonate. So this was kind of an unexpected reaction. Now the next compound is this interesting hexamethyl substance. So this was an unexpected cleavage reaction. And so one of the things I was trying to do is I was trying to tetramethylate this bis thiocyanate and I was hoping that I could cleave off the thiocyanate separately afterwards and so what I did was I treated this with iodomethane at room temp in DMF with potassium carbonate but instead of getting the expected tetramethyl bis thiocyanate product I actually got this hexamethyl product and so some sort of alkylation reaction must have occurred on the sulfur where iodide then attacked at the nitrile forming something like cyanogen iodide but I was never able to determine the mechanism of this reaction so one of the things I did is I tried pre-methylating this compound and uh, via, like before I actually installed the thiocyanates, I just methylated, then put the thiocyanates on. But when I tried treating that with iodomethane, I didn't observe any conversion to the blue product. And so it's still not super clear what the heck happened, but this was a really odd, unexpected reaction. And these types of things happen in research all the time, especially if you know to look for them. Now, in this case, this wasn't a groundbreaking result, but sometimes the side reactions can actually be really useful and they can push forward our understanding of science. Now, the next compound is this weird four-membered ring with two sulfurs in it. And the lesson from this one was sometimes pure chemicals react on their own. And this is a new way to make two chloropropane that I don't think anyone will be adopting anytime soon. So I'd been working on this project to make this yellow compound here, this chloromethyl sulfide. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to alkylate phenols with it, but I can get into this another time. And so I'd made this just before COVID kind of happened. And right after the COVID lockdowns occurred, we had to just store this, put it in a vial, work from home for several months. And so when we got back and we did some analysis on it, it turned out that it had entirely converted to this four membered ring. We had actually identified this by GCMS uh, as we were also able to see two chloropropane. And so after some thought about possible mechanisms, what we figured out is that this thiocarbonyl must have just attacked and displaced this chloride via an SN2 reaction, and then chloride was able to attack at the secondary position, uh, forming chloro 2 chloropropane. Uh, this is kind of a neat product, and if you asked me how to synthesize that before this reaction had been an observed thing in our lab, I would have had no idea how you'd even make that. So in the next example, we have this weird... Uh, octafluorodecalin ring. And so what happened is rings like to form. And so initially what we were trying to do is we were doing this reaction where you take benzene and perfluoroalkyl bromides or iodides. And in the presence of a radical initiator, what you can do is you can radically substitute the benzene ring with your RF group. RF just means something perfluorinated. Now, when you do this reaction, you get a lot of side products because radical chemistry is really messy. So you'll get iodobenzene or bromobenzene, depending on whether you use an iodide or bromide, you'll get phenylbenzoate, biphenyl, etc. And so what we were doing is we were taking 1,4-diiodoperfluorobutane in the presence of benzoyl peroxide and a copper acetate catalyst. And we were trying to form this, octa, this octafluoroiodobutyl phenylated product. But what was happening is the once this was formed, 
this was reacting further with the initiator and it was forming uh, a radical that could do an intramolecular radical attack on the benzene ring, forming this octafluoro decalin product. So this is kind of interesting. Now in the next and final example, we have this weird N vinyl species. And the lesson from this one is that mercury is promiscuous. And if you leave it for too long, it'll get busy. So what happens is you can take an alcohol, an ethyl vinyl ether, in the presence of a mercury catalyst, and usually overnight, this is like a sufficient amount of time, you'll get a vinyl ether via the formation of ethanol as a byproduct. So mercury and your alcohol will add to this, but then mercury can re-eliminate off, um, forming uh, like a mercury salt as well as ethanol as your product. And so this would be the goal. Um, now, I did this, but I accidentally left my reaction too long. So this is tryptophol. It's an indole containing ethanol. And when I left this for a couple days, it was two or three days, it had entirely converted to this N-vinyl, O-vinyl species. And there's no reports of this type of reaction of N-vinylation with mercury in the literature. Um, however, it seems like it's not that useful of a reaction because you can just treat indoles with acetylene and get the same sort of N-vinyl products. But this is a surprising reaction. So you always hear about oxymercuration, but never aminomercuration. So hopefully uh, this story is about the weird five compounds that I made accidentally but figured out their structure was entertaining to you. Uh, I have some more interesting stories that I can talk about in the future if you guys like this. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. And I hope you have a great day.